Hi, I'm James Turner, and welcome again to One Take Demos. We're continuing our look at Lisp today, at Common Lisp, with uh, a look at how to define functions. As you recall, last time we kind of went over data types and the basic syntax of Lisp. So today we're going to actually start to use that a little bit to write some simple functions and to go over a little bit of the syntax of how you uh, define method signatures, as it were, uh, function signatures in Lisp. So let's start with a very simple function that just adds the two arguments and returns that as a value. So the name of the function defining function, as it were, in Lisp is defin, stands for defined function. First argument is the name of the function, so we'll call it add to, which is just what it does, it takes arguments a and b, and it returns a value plus a b. Couple of things to notice here. First thing is that the basic layout of it is defin, the name of the function, the argument list in parens, because it's a list of arguments, and then everything after that is body, and the last form evaluated in the body is the value returned. So in this case, since there's only one form in the body, which is the plus, that's what's going to get returned. So now we can say add two, two, three and we get 5. Now, those of you who might be a little bit more perceptive might be saying, hey, I thought everything in Lisp got evaluated. Why didn't you need to quote the add2 to keep it from trying to evaluate add2 as a symbol and get its value back and get an error because add2 doesn't have a value? Well, when I said that there's no syntactic sugar, or very little syntactic sugar in Lisp, there is a little bit of it, and one of them is that um, neither of these two uh, arguments, the argument list or the name of the function, get evaluated. Uh, in fact, definite is a type of macro. Um, you can define your own macros, which allows you to control what does and doesn't get evaluated. Uh, we'll see later on how to do that. Uh, another example of where uh, you'll see quoting of arguments so that you don't have to do it is in the set queue function, which we may get to next time, as opposed to set, which you do have to quote the argument. Sometimes it's useful to actually have the, eval the argument evaluated because then you can have a variable that, for example, has the name of what you want to set and that gets evaluated and then the value gets set to it as opposed to, in fact, let me just show you that because there's a function called set queue. So if I say set queue a4, that sets a to 4, then I have an x open print. So then if I just type a, it's 4. I can also say set double quote of b to 4, set evaluates its first argument, or 5, right? So, again, b was set to 5, but watch this. Suppose I say set queue c to be quote d, and then I say set c to be 10. What do you think I set there? Did I set c or d? Well, I set d because, again, this is set evaluates its first argument, or set queue, which stands for set quote, doesn't. So I set C to the value of the symbol D, and then I set D, because that got evaluated, to 10. So anyway, that was a little short digression. There's our, if we look up there, there's the function we defined. Um, so now I'm going to show you both an interesting feature of Lisp and a little bit more about argument lists. So one of the classic things they demonstrate how to do in Lisp is factorials, because it's a nice example of a recursive function. And one of the things that Lisp is good at, especially when you're operating on trees of data, which we'll look at later, is recursion to walk the tree. In this case, we're just going to write our standard factorial, and we're going to start by doing it kind of the way that uh, everyone gets taught to code it, which is not um, what we call tail recursive. And I'll show you why that's important in a second. So, you know, um, if n, let's say if equal n1, return 1, sorry, you don't return, it's return from if wanted. I've been coding Java too much lately. 1, otherwise return times n fact 1 minus n. So if we go through and walk this, what's going to happen is you hand in some number to the function like 10, 
if that number is equal to 1, factorial of 1 is 1, so you just return it. Otherwise, you multiply the current number times the factorial of taking 1 less than n. So if we walk this in with 2, it's going to come in with 2. 2 isn't equal to 1, so it's going to say, okay, multiply 2 times the factorial of 1 minus 2, which is 1. It'll come back in, n equals 1. Uh, so n does equal 1, so it'll return 1, come back out. 1 times 2 is 2, and then it'll come back. So in fact, factorial of 2 is 2, no surprise. Now, here's the problem with, with coding it this way and why in most languages you wouldn't code it this way if they don't implement tail recursion. What's factorial of 10,000? I overflowed my stack and that's not a surprise because basically um, if we did a backtrace here, right, we've been, you know, calling over and over and over uh, recursively. So, what's another way we can write that so that it doesn't tip, so that it doesn't keep going back on the stack? Well, I'm going to show you, and in the process, I'm going to show you something about uh, argument lists. So let's define tail fact, which takes n as before, but now it also says and optional. We'll call it intermediate, and that has a value of 1 by default, and I'll go over a little bit what that means in a second. So, we still do if equal n1, now we're going to use a different function, which is called return from tail fact 1. I'm just writing it this way to make sure that uh, I don't have to, I'll have to explain a second line right here. Um, so, if n is equal to 1, then return from the function with 1. Otherwise, return tail fact of 1 minus n and times n and the intermediate. So this is kind of a different way of writing this. If we go in, if you start by calling tail fact with, say, 2, there, you're not giving it a second argument, right? So what n optional says is if I don't give you a second argument, then set the argument to whatever the second value or the value inside the print is. So if I called this with n3, it would set intermediate to 3. If you just called with n, it'll set intermediate to 1. So again, if n is equal to 1, we're just going to return 1. Otherwise, we're going to call it again with 1 minus n and do the multiplication here. So if you notice, the very last thing that this function does is call itself again. This is called tail recursion. And because it's calling itself at the very end, we know we don't need any of the old values, right? It's already evaluated this. It's already evaluated that. So we know that it doesn't need anything that's on the stack. So in fact, it can throw the stack away. So from a uh, stack perspective, this is exactly the same as doing an iterative loop in terms of the amount of stack you use. Now, if I just called it now, I would get a stack overflow. And the reason is that you have to compile it to get the optimization. Um, Lisp is interpreted, but you can compile. It doesn't compile down to machine language, but it compiles to a more optimized form. So now if I call tail fact of, say, some outrageous number like 10,000, which would blow up the stack normally, I have a bug. <laughs> It's probably because it's based on my stack, uh, returning from, yeah, if I can get a definition from the entire stack, I think I can get away with doing this. What happened there was, because I optimized, there was only one tail fact on the stack. I'm going to do it this way, and I'm going to get rid of one, close friend. Yeah, three more, close friend, 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 close Don't return one, you return the intermediate. Okay. That was a short little diversion into bad coding. There we go. So again, I had to compile it or else it's gonna blow up the stack because it won't have done the optimization. And there we go. We just got the factorial of ten thousand very quickly and this again shows that you can have extremely large, arbitrarily large uh, numbers 
in Lisp because it represents them as big thumbs. And by the way, an interesting fact you'll notice when you take factorials of large numbers is that uh, if they happen, actually for any of them, they will always end in a lot of zeros. And the reason is that every time you've taken the factorial of anything that is a power of 10, it's added a zero, one or more zeros to the end. So eventually you accumulate them all. All right, so again, in this little uh, slightly flawed path through uh, functions, we've seen how to uh, define a simple function, and we've seen how to use an optional argument. We've also gone over a little bit of the quoting uh, conventions that are used in Lisp and how you can leverage those. In the next demo, we're going to go over a little bit about bindings. We've been seeing some variable bindings kind of as we pass by, but we're going to go through them a little bit more explicitly next time. And we'll also look at a few more interesting things you can do with uh, function arguments, and we may also talk a little bit about free-floating functions, which are called lambda expressions. Until then, this is James Turner for One Take Demos.